Thank you for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you six stories from my life, mostly because I'm very self-obsessed, but hopefully uh, some of them will be interesting to you. The, if you have an urge uh, at any time uh, to do a standing ovation, that's allowed. <laughs> um, so first of all, my name is Harold Thorsten, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The, <laughs> Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, but mostly I tweet from our, uh, the Ueno account. Uh, but that's me and my daughter, she's six, her name is Emma. Um, the reason I was invited here was to talk, uh, well, I don't know. But I, I, I think I was invited because I, uh, like Peter said, I found an agency called Ueno. And um, we, we create different types of things. We create products uh, and branding, marketing. Um, but ultimately, I think we create relationships. And I want to tell you uh, more about that later. But first, I think I, I should show you some projects just to give you a sense of the type of work we do. Um, we've done a lot of video-related uh, products and experiences. Um, this one is from Red Bull TV. We worked a lot with Uber. Uh, this is from Uber Design. We also worked with them on their uh, on Uber.com. Uh, worked on the Oculus launch. Uh, we worked a lot with Reuters, built a, a video-based app for them. Worked with Lonely Planet. Zero is a, uh, a fintech product company that we helped launch. Uh, we were working with Visa on creating um, a way for you to get a credit card without uh, going to a bank. So you do this all through your phone. I worked more with Reuters. Um, we worked last year with ESPN on launching the 2017 body issue. I worked with Dropbox. Uh, did this thing. Uh, we launched the first homepage of Medium. Uh, we worked a lot with, with Facebook uh, on different products and, and things. This is from a, a bot uh, product that we worked with them on, another video product. Um, we launched with the Slack team uh, a new Slack.com last year, and so on. Um, but mostly, I want to talk to you about uh, me. Um, and uh, I want to try and do that by telling you about uh, Ueno and our values, and then try and, uh, and tie them back to a story in my life. I think it's pretty clever. Um, so these are the six core values that we created at Ueno. We worked on this last year. Uh, we put a lot of time into this, um, but I'll, I'll, not that interesting. You don't have to take a photo. Uh, <laughs> we will, uh, I'll talk about each and every one of those in, later, but here are the ones we have. And the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to tell you a story uh, about something that happened to me. Um, most of them are true, and then I'm going to tell you how that relates to a, uh, a value at Ueno, and then just a little bit about how that is, uh, translates into the work that we do and how we want to approach life and, and projects. The first one is, uh, happens here in, um, what was it? 2013, yes. Uh, and in 2013, I was living in Buenos Aires with uh, my wife and our daughter, Emma, who you saw before. We had been living in different countries for uh, a few years. We would, we would travel every three to six months to a new city. And uh, it was Christmas Day in Buenos Aires, and I, I needed uh, a name for my agency that I was about to start. And I wanted to start an agency because I had been freelancing for seven years, and I thought I could make more money if I started an agency, uh, but also to do more things than that, but I think mostly for the money. And I, um, we were walking around. It was Christmas Day. It was really warm, as it is in, on Christmas in, in South America. And 
Um, we started talking about where we've been uh, these last few years, and uh, I, I thought about a place called the Ueno Park, it's in Tokyo, and it was on the Amanote Line, which is one of the main uh, lines in Tokyo, and I always really liked the name, but I also liked the location. It's a, it's a place where uh, uh, there's, there's museums, there's, uh, there's science, there's art, um, there's, there's a zoo, there's people come there, mostly Japanese people come there to do weird things, and it's just a wonderful place. And I thought, that's a nice name. And then because I was in, 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 in Latin America, I, uh, one of my favorite words in Spanish was, was bueno. So I thought, that's kind of nice. Um, and it connected a lot of different things for me. And I thought, that is kind of a nice name that we have. And this is where I try and tie it back to the value thing. Um, and our first value is that we're all in this together. And for me, that means we work very closely with our people and our teams and our clients, but we also um, are part of the world and we want to be uh, good citizens of the world. So as uh, a part of that, we, we founded something called Bueno, uh, which is our way to give back to the world. We use it to donate money or time or resources or whatever we can to help great people do great things. Um, one example is we donated uh, to Planned Parenthood to help um, bridge the gap that they face every day when they come under attack uh, for whatever reason. Okay, that was number one. I don't think that went really well, but I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> 97. In 1997, I, I was 20 years old and I I, uh, I started my first serious relationship, and it was really great for a while, and it was um, with a wonderful woman, or a girl, or I don't know, woman, and, <laughs> and um, it was great for a while, we had a great couple of years, but we stayed together for six years, and I think looking back, especially now, and even then, I knew that we shouldn't have. Not because she wasn't great, uh, or that I wasn't great, obviously, but <laughs> the, we just didn't work together. And so I, uh, I, I just hung in there because, I don't know, because I did. And it, it was easy, and it was easier than to be honest with myself and to be honest with her. Um, and it just dragged on. We ended up you know, doing, hurting each other a lot more than we had to. Uh, doing things that we were not proud of. And that leads me to the second Ueno value, which is be raw. And I think this is uh, one of my favorites. It's we have to be as, uh, honest with ourselves and with others um, to, to live our best lives. If we're not, we really can't do great work. We can't be happy. We can't really do anything. Hey, Robin. Uh, Robin is here. Stand up, Robin. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Um, and we also want to be sure that we're, uh, we speak truth to authority. Um, we took out this poster. Thank you. If you want to stand up, that's fine. Um, so we took out this poster uh, uh, here by the, on the 101, right by the airport. Um, they wouldn't let us write what we wanted to write, but <laughs> we were pretty clever. <laughs> so 1990, no, 83, uh, I was six years old, and that's actually not me, uh, that's my daughter, but she looks a lot like me and I couldn't find a good picture. So. <laughs> In 1983, I was six years old, um, and you know, even as a six-year-old, six I was pretty great. But I, I, I had some issues. I couldn't run as fast as my my uh, my friends and the people I played with. I couldn't jump as high, and I, I really 
started to notice it at this point. And I remember this time, and I thought, I knew that I had a disease, I had muscle dystrophy, but I, I really didn't know what it meant uh, until that point. I realized um, that it actually was not just the name of a disease, it had some implications. And over the years, there's been a lot of moments like that where I thought, oh wow, there's actually something happening here in my body that's, that's failing me. And I had moments where I uh, remember when I noticed that I couldn't walk upstairs anymore, or I, I couldn't play the guitar anymore, or I, I couldn't pick up my kids. And they were all devastating, but they really um, taught me that I, despite that, I could do pretty much anything I wanted. And I, I can uh, do things differently, and I can do things, uh, you know, obviously better than you. And, <laughs> and I can, uh, you know, if I, I approach things in this way, I can be a lot more, um, if I don't give myself an out, if I don't give myself an excuse, I can do pretty much anything I want. Um, and here's a stupid thing that we did um, that sort of shows that. There was this, a project we worked on a few years ago <laughs> for um, a company that we helped name was called Hubcap. We gave them a mascot, which was um, a hedgehog. And then we, th we were doing a, a, a photo shoot, a video shoot for our uh, for a case study. <laughs> and uh, turns out you can't actually get a hedgehog in San Francisco or California. They're not allowed as pets. And so we thought, well, we could either do nothing or we could just get some rabbits <laughs> and nobody will notice. <laughs> and uh, I think it's even better than, than actually if we got a hedgehog. So, you know, you just have to do what you can. Um, 2004, I... Uh, I bought my first place, uh, it's a photo, and the, uh, it was a, a great small little house uh, in, in Iceland, and it was in my favorite neighborhood, it was in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and I, I really loved the house, but I, I made a mistake because it was, you know, it was a terrible building constructurally, and I had to basically tear it all down to, uh, make it work. And all of a sudden I had a house that was broken that I had paid all this money for, all the money that I had and a lot more. And I had no way of, of paying for it, uh, the, the renovation. So I, I did what everyone should do. I just called my friends and asked them if they could work for free for six months. <laughs> and they amazingly said yes. And um, well, I didn't tell them about the six months, but they, they you know, you have to build up to something like that. You can't just spring that on someone. You just do it one day at a time, and then they're sort of on the hook and they can't leave. Um, but I worked uh, on that house for six months, and it really taught me a lot about uh, teamwork and sort of camaraderie and about how if everyone comes together, we, you know, a lot of things can be done. We had a lot of amateurs, but we also had a few friends that had done things in the past, and we had people that were maybe more traditionally, they would be carpenters, but they would be helping out with the painting or the electricity, and uh, that brings me to the, to the value. This one was a little loose. Um, the connection to the story is a little loose, but you know, I'm hoping you won't notice. The, um, the thing that I, I took away from that is, um, if everyone sees it as their job, that the whole project is a success, the project will be a success. If people just focus on their area of expertise within the project, it won't work. So the only way that a project at Ueno works is if everyone comes together, everyone is responsible for the end output. Yes, everyone has a role in it, but they're also responsible for, uh, you know, the developer is responsible for the design, the designer is responsible for the copywriting, um, and, and so on. And I'm sort of technically responsible for everything. Um, and so when we work together on projects, we really want to try and, and bring everyone together to make sure that everyone is... Uh, that's not good. I'm frozen too.
Um, sorry, I'm going to go back and see if that works. It's a nice video. Cost a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's see if this plays. So, uh, as I was saying, we want to try and make sure that people come together, um, that they collaborate, that they bring their shared knowledge to create something that's a lot better and bigger than they could create on their own. And um, again, if, if the developer is responsible for the, uh, is, is co-responsible, let's say, for the copy, they're supposed to speak up if something is, you know, something we write doesn't make any sense. Uh, if the designer is also thinking about um, everything from the brand to the, to the development, doing the QA, doing uh, the production design, we hope, hopefully, ultimately, there they go. Um, I think this was like 20 different shots. This is not like a live stream from the office. Uh, <laughs> just so, so the way the marketing works is you kind of create a fake thing and then you s try and make that work. So that was that. We, we had to, like, that was choreographed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 2012, I think this is the last story, and I have eight more minutes, so I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> do I have to? Oh. I don't know if I have to stay here for eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so in 2012, I... Um, no, shit, this is actually not the last story. There's two more stories. Okay, I think I got this. Okay, so... <laughs> I might be actually low on time. Okay, so the, in, 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 in 2012, I was living in, uh, in Tokyo, uh, as you will remember from the previous story, and I, um, I had recently stopped drinking. I was uh, a really seriously full-blown alcoholic for about five years, and like everything else, I did that really well. And <laughs> so I got drunk every day, uh, pretty much... Uh, yeah, every day, and and then I stopped that. I moved to Tokyo, um, obviously, and um, I I have been working a lot with. Um, I was freelancing. And I was working a lot with an agency called Upper Quad, and they uh, and Phil, the owner of Upper Quad, I think Phil is here. Stand up, Phil. <laughs> Phil's great. Uh, Phil uh, gave me a lot of opportunities and helped me uh, uh, tremendously. He gave me the opportunity uh, to work on this project called Sand Tracker. Google was, uh, at the time, one of Upper Quad's biggest clients, and, um, and still is, I think. And they, uh, they came to Upper Quad, and they, they asked them to help with, that, with this sort of very vague idea. They wanted to create something called a Santa Tracker, where you could, on, on Christmas, you were a kid, you would um, see where Santa was. And um, I don't know if I should tell you, Santa is actually not real. And, and so this is all kind of made up. But uh, again, marketing. And, and, uh, but we, um, we came up with, with uh, this idea. Yes, on the 24th, you can follow Santa. But that, that's, there's not a lot of things to go from there. There's a map. Um, there's a pin, and then there's like flying Santa, and you know, that, you know what can you do? And so we we built up, uh, created an idea of, uh, for a Santa tracker, which was, let's say, there's a village, people can uh, come there every day. There's an advent calendar, you can open up a new experience, and um, and it will be great. And it actually was, and it was the first sort of time that I had this, uh, I had this epiphany that yes, I can just. Uh, as a part of a team, um, really influenced something by going above and beyond. We, we had a brief that called for one thing, we gave them that, but we also gave them something a lot bigger, which became the Santa Tracker, which ties to this next value, which is bring the chocolate. Um, this comes from a, uh, an employee we have, uh, or had, uh, it was called Robin. It was not that Robin over there, it's another Robin, better Robin. And he... <laughs> Uh, he would have this saying where he would say, if someone asks you for a cup of coffee, you should bring the chocolate. Um, both literally, uh, but also, uh, I think it's a metaphor, you see? And uh, 
you, someone asks you for a cup of coffee, um, you first of all ask yourself, you know, is that my job? But if it is, <laughs> uh, maybe bring them a cup of coffee and give them something extra. Give them a piece of chocolate, something that, uh, that um, enhances the experience that they were expecting. And uh, at Ueno, we try and do that uh, both literally. We actually made some chocolates that we give to clients uh, and to people. Mostly the packaging is good, the chocolate doesn't taste that great. <laughs> but um, it's more the idea that counts. Um, and and it, it applies to how we work on projects as well. We want to be able to work with the client, uh, serve and, and fulfill their actual need. Um, keep in mind, in the metaphor, that's the coffee. And then we give them something else, the chocolate, which is something that they weren't expecting, something that is... This, is is better, something that makes their, uh, their project a bigger success, makes um, whatever it is. Um, so that's how that works. Anyway, last story, and now I have three minutes, so I'll just talk really fast. And 1988, um, in 1988, I was 11 years old. I, um, I was going away for the first time um, abroad. I had been to Denmark before. Um, and no offense to Denmark, but you know, you know, it's Denmark. So I, <laughs> I, uh, my parents um, had split up. I was living with my my dad and my stepmom, and they had decided to go to uh, Disneyland in Florida, and which you know, as an 11 year old, is just like magic, especially especially if you've never really been anywhere, you know, except for Denmark, and. Um, and it was amazing. We went there. I, uh, it was uh, a group trip. It was, um, you know, a lot of different families. So I, I had a lot of fun. I had a crush on a girl. I, um, I went to Disneyland. I went to the water theme parks. It was just the most amazing time. Um, and then I flew back, and I, uh, I was so excited to go and tell my mom that um, about all these things. And I was, uh, you know, I had a tan and everything, which, which was amazing. And I. Uh, I had these photos that I wanted to show, and I came home, it was early morning, we landed really early, um, and I was preparing uh, this story that I would tell my mom. I would call her and I'd say, um, um, you know, uh, we missed the flight or something, gave her some excuse and say, you know, I, I didn't make it, but she only lived a few blocks away, so I was going to then go over to her place and surprise her. And as I was doing this and getting ready, my dad called me in, and um, he, was, he was sitting in the, in the living room drinking tea. And yeah, you know, he sat me down and he hugged me and he told me that um, a few days before um, there had been a man that had um, was uh, on leave from um, he had some issues uh, with his with his mind. He, he got drunk. He stole a car that was running somewhere, uh, and he hit my mom when she had died. And it was awful, obviously. Um, and it, it, it kind of wrecked me for a long time, and it still does. But I, I keep thinking about that moment for myself and, and for my kids and for everyone of, um, you know, ultimately, we're all going to die, sorry. But um, we can use that in two different ways. We can either say, you know, that's a bummer, which it is, or we can say, let's make the best use of our time that we have here. Um, and at the company, at Ueno, that means um, we want to enjoy our, our, our work, we want to enjoy the people we work with, we want to um, form and create real relationships, we want to look back on the time. And so, you know that old saying, like, you know, when you're on your deathbed, nobody wants to work, uh, have spent more time at the office. We actually want that. We want people to look back and say, I wish I had spent more time at the office. Uh, th those were kind of the best years of my life, um, and not in a sad way because it was, you know, it was just pretty really great. Um, I have four more seconds. Uh, so, thanks everyone. Um, I I want to leave uh, on a high note. So this is my favorite song. Um, we're hiring. In case you want a job. Uh, <laughs> We made this thing, it's called The Interview, it's, it's really great. Uh, thank you and have fun today. Bye. Yeah, if you want to do a standing ovation, that's... Thank you.